and we are going to turn it over to Ann Whalen to get us started. Hello, hello, Ann. Hi there. Um, good morning, everyone, and hello. welcome MIT retirees and friends to today's readings by our memoir group. I'm Ann Hartung Whalen, treasurer of the Association of MIT Retirees, and joining us from the advisory committee are Elsa Tien, Ruth Tanzi, and Claudia Labolita James. Also here and helping us tremendously are Tracy Schwartz and Anthony Farrell. Without them, this Zoom meeting would not have been possible. On behalf of the committee, I hope you and your loved ones are staying healthy and managing in these extraordinary times as well as possible. We are all hoping and looking forward to 2021 and hoping to enjoy activities, learning and trips and each other's in-person company. We are delighted today to bring you stories from five members of the Nita Renier Memoir Writing Group. The group was formed in 2011 with the help and encouragement of committee members Elsa Tien and Nita Renier, and also the able help of Bill Snow and Karen Luxton. As a former instructor in the MIT program in writing and humanistic studies, Nita took a new group of writers under her wing and guided them to tell their personal stories in a natural way. As you can imagine, sharing these small, sharing these stories in a small group has inspired deep and lasting friendships among the writers. Nita led the group until her passing in 2018 at the age of 95. Shortly before her passing, the writers officially named the group Nita Renier Memoir Writing Group as a tribute to Nita's generosity and dedication. We are also pleased to welcome two of Nita's daughters today, Julie and Henny Renier. The group of the new and longstanding members is enthousi enthusiastically continues today under the strong leadership of Daphne Straussman. Daphne is a writing professor, memoirist, and published author. She currently teaches at Grub Street Boston and the Mass College of Art. And previously, Daphne taught at Lesley University and the New England Conservatory of Music. Today, Daphne serves on a committee at Mass College of Art that is charged with authoring a new guide for its writing program. Our memoir group meets monthly. Currently, we're on Zoom, and the group will resume its normal on-campus meetings when we are able to do it safely. I'd like to tell you that the association provides comp complimentary parking when the meetings are on campus and new writers and new voices are always welcome. I'm pleased now to turn the event over to Daphne and she will tell you a little bit about herself, memoir writing, the group's upcoming publication and introduce our writers to you. As a brief reminder, if you're joining us late, this is being recorded and will be posted on our website for viewing for other people and to share. Thank you and enjoy. And Daphne, I'll leave it for you. Thank you so much, Anne. Um, so welcome everybody and good morning. I'm so happy to see all these faces and to see the writers finally getting an opportunity to share with you all exactly what they've been working on. So um, I am the lucky person who gets to hear and uh, read the stories of these amazing individuals and their rich and exciting lives. So um, I came to the group about two years ago, both because I love memoir and I came to it um, a little late in life. I resisted it because I actually wrote a lot in um, or tried to write um, fiction. But as I developed more of this kind of fiction, I started to realize that all of the stories were actually just my stories and very, very thinly veiled and very, very, um, um, they weren't concealed well. So I just finally gave in. And the reason why is because memoir has kind of a bad rap of being navel gazing and um, you know sen sensational and that it's all about kind of superfluous things. In reality, memoir is the best way that we can actually tell stories about our lives. 
about not so much the entirety of our lives, but about moments that create connections with others. The other reason why I was interested actually in joining this group is because I do have connections to MIT because of my husband who came in as a college freshman, decided that he had found his tribe and didn't leave until 11 years later with a PhD. And my father-in-law who graduated from MIT in 55. My husband graduated in 91. And throughout the years, I've heard them talk about the um, amazing uh, connection and the, the formative way in which their experiences at MIT shaped their lives. Around that time also, my father-in-law who had retired, according to my mother-in-law, would go into his uh, office, close the door and wouldn't come out for hours because he was going back to a painful time in his life of being um, a survivor of the Holocaust, going to the Tatras Mountains and uh, joining the partisans and fighting Nazis and losing his whole family in the process. And for us, it gave us a different way of appreciating him, of thinking about him, not as just this kind of accomplished, um, bigger than life person, but also somebody who had experienced fear or disconnect or isolation. Um, somebody who was a child who lost parents. And it's a different way of understanding somebody who we felt had accomplished so much in his life. And that's the beauty of memoir, I think, is that it allows us to create connections with not just what we do, but how we do it and how we live our lives. So Gabriel Garcia Marquez said, it's not so much that you have a life that you've lived, but how you remember it in order to tell others about it, to write about it. And that's what these writers do. So for this, um, this group and all of the stories that they have to come together and to be able to share them openly and for us to learn from them and for us to be able to relish in some of their adventures is a, an incredible opportunity that I just couldn't pass up. So um, I want you all, as you hear these stories to just maybe think about your own stories. The, the fact that you know, we revere the novel as you know, kind of the literary pinnacle of, of, of how we understand literature to work is um, certainly something that just kind of kept memoir a little bit too much in the background. And thankfully now, because we are able to understand that memoir gives us a lot more, we can maybe appreciate the stories that these um, writers have to tell us. One of the, the ways in which I was very pleasantly surprised uh, and about another way that memoir and this group just worked for me is that I grew up in Dominican Republic. So my first language is Spanish. And so I write in Spanish um, and I read in Spanish, but not as often as I like. And being from Dominican Republic, there wasn't a big Dominican community that, that I had to come to. And it, um, like the first time I came to the group, one of the writers is actually from Dominican Republic. And hearing the stories of this writer allowed me to also travel back in time and to remember things about my own country and my own upbringing and hear uh, you know, their voice in my head as I had heard it before when I was a child. It gave me something back. So the idea that we all still have these kind of um, experiences that we share with others, either when you get together with your family or when you're around a group in a meeting and you're bringing these incredible um, opportunities of, of connection through shared stories is exactly what I think memoir does so well. So anytime that you think about something that has happened in your life, it could be the most innocuous moment, but if it means something to you and you feel that that moment is something that you can share with the world, it's something that you should be writing down. And it is a gift to your family, it is a gift to, um, to your peers. It is a gift to everyone uh, to find places where we all can actually connect, which heavens knows we need a, a lot of that uh, these days when we all feeling like we're in our homes, isolated and unable to really um, uh, hang out with each other. So 
um, I invite you to enjoy these stories um, and to think about your own. And if you feel like you want to write about them, then you should go ahead and do it and, and give these to your family. But also if you feel like it's something that you'd like to come and, and do with us, uh, please reach out and see if you can um, find ways that you can join the group, especially now that we're, we're doing so remotely. So um, before I let you go, I just wanted to remind you that you can ask uh, questions as the um, writers are reading. You can put those in the chat and then at the end, we will go ahead and uh, just read those and, and have the writers um, answer those for you. Um, so consider joining the group. Um, consider writing your own stories. And um, with that, I will introduce our first reader. So our first reader is Tom. Uh, Tom retired from the MIT Lincoln Lab in June 2017. In an attempt to broaden his left brain capabilities, he immediately joined the Nita Rainier Memoir Group to learn and practice the art of memoir. That is, writing interesting and compelling life stories. With the aid of a patient audience, a practice professional teacher, and a growing reservoir of ideas, he has developed and shared over 20 pieces with the group. His stories focus on life growing up in upstate New York, coming of age in the 1970s, and the trials and tribulations of 40 years of married life. Today, he shares a story about a challenge he faced as a newly married grad student in the winter of 1975. So, welcome, Tom. Yes, thank you for everyone for coming. Uh, just as a little bit of um, context, uh, what I'd like to do is, this is a story uh, that took place uh, the winter after I was married in 1975 and still learning uh, how to become part of a, uh, you know, a married couple. And it shows a little bit about the struggle of um, you know, early graduate student life, but also how two people who are just starting to get to know how to live together uh, work through sort of daily problems. So let me begin. Dead battery, no problem. Kathy and I struggled financially in the first months after our May 1975 marriage. Without a bulging bank account, access to credit or parental largesse, simply paying rent and buying food on a $300 a month research assistant stipend challenged our parsimonious tendencies. We lived with a simple rule. If you don't need it, don't buy it. The country was in recession when Kathy arrived in Colorado only three weeks after she was handed her diploma uh, a week after we walked out of the church side by side. Career starting jobs for new college grads were rare and hard to find. Fortunately, Kathy's math degree and year long part-time computer programming internship during her senior year at the University of Rochester's Strong Memorial Hospital led to a job offer in November. She would take her first step into the IT world, a term still years from coinage, as a COBOL programmer for a Denver Bay Denver-based bank service company. Her monthly $750 paycheck tripled our income and started us toward financial security. But old habits were hard to break. Caution ruled. Thankfully, the Land Rover was designed for stressful conditions. As a grad student in the astrogeophysics program, I occasionally conducted night sky observing sessions at, at the CU campus observatory. On a clear, still, moonless December night, I shared Jupiter and its four Galilean moons, Saturn with its stunning rings, and a few Messier objects with an enthusiastic crowd. The observing conditions were perfect for a night-long viewing session. The group was eager to stay and fight the deepening cold in the open dome as I was. Hour after hour, hour after hour, I sent through the telescope on interesting celestial bodies. The oohs and ahs heard whenever someone peered into the eyepiece interrupted my fact-filled orations. I homed the telescope and closed the dome by midnight. After a short walk to married student housing on 30th Street, I was home by 12.30 a.m. With no, with no morning classes, I was looking forward to sleeping in. A shrill, Tom, wake up. The car won't start, shatters my dreamscape. Adrenaline jolts me from the warm caress of the waterbed to heart-pounding awakeness. With my residual grogginess, all I can muster is a confused what. With clear urgency, Kathy repeats her car, repeats her cry, 
The car won't start. I'll miss the bus. Kathy had decided to take the commuter bus to Denver as soon as she was offered the programming job. She didn't relish the thought of big city driving. Taking the bus would save a few dollars. More important, her greening sensibility con compelled her to conserve. While riding the bus, the gas that could propel the Land Rover on the 26 mile trip would remain unburnt and in the ground, while time on the bus would allow her to twiddle her crochet hooks, fashioning ornaments for our first Christmas tree. As the fog of sleep evaporates, I comprehend the situation. The solution is obvious to me because I already practiced it. My concerns quickly diminish. I slowly rustle from the bed. I have no need to hurry. Kathy, unaware of my solution, doesn't share my lack of urgency. Tom, get up. Okay, okay, no need to worry. I'll get it started. Not confident in my mechanical or electrical skills, she emphatically disagrees. I don't think you should be so cavalier with my time. I know it's a dead battery. There's nothing you can do to fix it right now. I slip on a pair of faded jeans, don a plaid flannel shirt, and slip on my sandals. Boulder winters are mostly snow free and mild compared to icy Rochester. My heavy, well-worn basket hiking boots stay in the closet. We are a contrast in appearance as we stroll out to the parking lot. A long-haired 70s grad student and an ERA-inspired working class woman wearing a dressy pantsuit over a white button-up shirt, accented as usual with a long, colorful, slow flowing scarf. Her unconstrained wavy hair is all that remains of her recent hippie-ish image as the process of morphing into a serious business businesswoman has begun. As we get to the car, she hands me the key. Under her stern, arm-crossed gaze, harder than the Teton's granite, and colder than the Arapaho Glacier, I climb into the Land Rover. My left foot depresses the clutch, the right gently nudges the accelerator. I turn the key. Nothing happens. No lights blaze, no noises escape the hood. No er, 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 no click, click, click. Thoughtfully, I deliver my diagnosis. The battery is dead. No kidding, that's what I said. Do you think Joe and Mary can drive me to the bus? I don't want to be late. With as comforting a voice as I can evoke, I confidently reply, no need, I'll have it running in a minute. Get in the car, put it in neutral, and when you see me wave, pump the gas twice. I see her reflection in the rearview mirror. Her confidence in my solution isn't rising as I walk to the back of the car. Her stony face glares as I open the back door. Bumping, thumping, and metal on metal scrapings follow as I root in the rear to extract a four foot long pole. I slam the rear door, walk to the front, and kneel out of her view. After more thumping and bumping, I wave, then shout, give it some gas. The car lurches side to side, once, twice, then vroom, it roars to life. Visibly relieved, the granite erodes, the, gl the glacier melts, and with relieved incredulity, Cass Kathy asks, how did you do that? Let me stow the crank. I'll tell you as I get you to the bus. As we drive, I fill her in on a few details of the Land Rover that she clearly was not aware of. I tell her that this vehicle is intended to be versatile and reliable for, lo for long duration, remote off-road treks. The car must start in the wilderness, including the wilds of 30th Street Boulder, if the battery dies. Lugging extra batteries is not practical. The solution is a, leg a legacy feature borrowed from the Model T, a crank start. Once we had the ability to start the car, we could spare the expense of a new, a new battery. Kathy agreed to wait to purchase a new battery, fully, fully aware that she would incur the additional early morning burden. The battery didn't make it onto our purchase list. Her windfall would be used to expand her work wardrobe, repair her balky sewing machine, and buy us a pair of how you bar sew it yourself down vest kits. Week after week in her newly sewn vest, covering crisp business attire, she would pull the crank out, slide it into the shaft, give a hearty twist, and wake up the sleeping car for the drive to the bus terminal. After six weeks of crank starting the Land Rover on dark and cold mornings, the battery made it to the top of our list. A positive slope on our bank account calmed our financial worries. We bought a new battery. Once again, a simple turn of a key started the car. Our early morning drama disappeared. The crank was stowed never to appear again.
Thank you. Snaps. <laughs> Thank you, Tom, so much. I love that story because I, I absolutely can just imagine a moment of being married to someone and trying to have that conversation. It has happened in this house for different reasons. So um, next, I'd love to introduce uh, Lucy. So a little bit about Lucy. Originally from New York, Lucy attended the New York City Public Schools and later earned a BFA in illustration from Syracuse University. She arrived in Boston in the fall of 1968 after returning from Peace Corps service in Africa. She has worked as a public school art teacher, solo owner of a gallery and studio in Cambridge, a software graphics illustrator for industry, and finally, as an admin in the Division of Comparative Medicine at MIT for 20 years. Her dream as a young girl was to be an artist and to have travel adventures, and she feels fortunate to have experienced both. She has lived in Cambridge for 50 years and raised her son and daughter here. Her late husband, Robert Wilhelm, attended MIT in the 1960s, and she never imagined she'd end up working there so many years later. Her earliest adventures in writing began with the letters to pen pals, friends and family, and later expanded to illustrated journals and essays. While anticipating retirement and exploring offerings for MIT retirees, she found the memoir writing group and it opened a wonderful new door of opportunity for connecting with others and sharing life stories. She was welcomed to the group in 2015. Lucy's grateful to MIT for her 20 years of employment and the richness of experience it has brought her. She retired in 2018 and is working hard at avoiding house cleaning in order to focus on drawing, painting, and writing with the memoir group. I'll turn it over to Lucy. Thank you, Daphne. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'll get right at it. My story titled, Leningrad to Yalta and a rented Volga. August, 1972. It was our delayed honeymoon, a full year after our wedding. My husband, Rob, a history buff, had taken a day trip by bus from Helsinki into the old Soviet Union a couple of years before and was eager to return and show me some of this forbidden land. I've always loved Russian history, he'd said. Wait till you see the statue of Peter the Great on his horse in full glory. We can do it on the cheap and stay in campsites. The Russians are courting tourists from the US and Europe now. They want hard currency, US dollars. We were ready to help the Russians out with our tourist dollars, peek behind the Iron Curtain, savor what we could of this mysterious culture and find out exactly why the big Russian bear was so scary. Also, we'd been told the Russian ice cream was excellent. Our plan was to start in England, travel north through Scandinavia and enter through Finland. Our passports were current. We had our youth hostel cards and our international driver's licenses. We'd rent a Russian car and drive from the north to the Crimea on the Black Sea and back. We carried a small two-person tent, sleeping bags, and new backpacks purchased at Eastern Mountain Sports so we could stay in campsites in the USSR for an entire month. How hard or scary could that be? From the campgrounds, we could easily drive into the cities to see sites like the Hermitage in Leningrad, Peterhof, even the circus in Moscow. A highlight would be swimming in the Black Sea at Yalta. In preparation for this plan, Rob had taken a course in Russian the previous spring at BU. An engineer by training, he'd always struggled with learning a foreign language. So in an effort to help things along, I'd made him a set of flashcards of the Cyrillic alphabet. With some practice sessions, he'd learned some basic survival phrases. I don't remember how bad his failing grade in the course was, but the result was I learned Russian and Rob could still not communicate beyond da and yet. My own vocabulary was flimsy, but I could read a map, say beer, and ask where the toilets were. This felt adequate at the time. Our adventure began with a visit to old friends in England and then north to Scandinavia by a series of boats, smaller and smaller ones. There were stops overnight in youth hostels, a landing in a tiny port in the Lofotens, then finally an overnight small boat through a long strait to Narvik on the mainland. There was some seasickness involved. It was quite a rough overnight crossing. Finally, the evening of departure on the night train to Helsinki arrived. The train was ominous looking, heavy Soviet-style steel carriages with 
TCCP, that's in Surowith, in large letters, along with a big red Russian star on each car. We were ushered to separate compartments, men in this one and women in that one. My top bunk was in a four sleeper with three elderly ladies carrying a lumpy assortment of worn cloth bags and who were speaking a Slavic language I didn't recognize. They giggled among themselves, mostly ignoring me. Evening fell and the light dimmed and the train chugged slowly out of the station. The one thin note of Russian hospitality after we settled in our compartment was a uniformed Russian man knocking at our door and delivering four glasses of hot tea, the glasses contained in a silver filigree holder. Such a surprising touch. I'd remembered my mother once telling me that her Russian Jewish neighbors in New York City always offered a glass of tea. Finally, I curled up in my top bunk, fully dressed and tried to sleep. I was exhausted and I had no energy to even open my journal. We rattled on through what appeared to be forests in the dark, and then suddenly at some point in the wee hours, the train slowed to a halt and there was a sharp banging at our compartment door. I'd seen enough old war movies that I immediately pictured a jackbooted officer banging with a rifle butt on the door who would force us out to march for miles in the snow. But of course, it was August. We'd arrived at the Finnish Russian border and we were to declare our money. I showed the officer my American dollars, whereupon he demanded, those are money. I pled that I had no other money, that I was showing all that I had. We'd been warned that smuggling currency into the USSR without declaring it could land a traveler in very unpleasant circumstances, like a Russian jail. Morning dawned, we were discharged from the train into bright daylight, rumpled and tired and hungry. At the in-tourist hotel, we'd been assured of our rental car a new compact Moskvich would be waiting, as well as our directions to the campsites. At the hotel desk, we met what was to be the first of many surly and sullen service employees. Wilhelm, the woman spat out harshly. There is no Moskvich, there is Walga. We were shown the car, a heavy, boxy, black New York City checker cab lookalike with no frills whatever, and a license plate that clearly said white letters on black, T-U-R for tourist in Cyrillic characters. This tell-all plate would identify us to all citizens we met along the way to our destination as foreign tourists. It would lead to many adventures, some pleasant, some not so. Rob had the brainstorm to spell out S-A-S-H-A, standing for USA in Russian, in masking tape on the rear of the car. And this little feature attracted much attention along our various stops. We were American celebrities. Our formal itinerary arranged earlier through the tiny in-tourist office above the coop in Harvard Square lay before us. It had us starting in Leningrad, now St. Petersburg, with stops at seven different campsites on a very specified route southward, including Moscow, Novgorod, Oryel, Kharkov, and Levshino, ending at Yalta on the Black Sea and returning via the same route. The map provided to us loosely resembled a child's drawing with no other road shown than the sketching one on which we were to travel. As we were to learn, this was a road to which we were seriously restricted as foreign tourists. We took turns driving. At one of the many roundabouts early in the trip, Rob drove off on the wrong spoke of the circle, was immediately stopped and pulled over by a stern looking uniformed officer, officiously waving a baton and demanding our papers. We were briskly ushered onto the correct road, but a tiny note of fear crept into us. We were now aware that we were being watched. This low level of fear remained with us throughout the month. We were young, I was 28, Rob 39, adventurous, wearing our broken and hiking boots and carrying all our gear of cooking utensils, a tiny gas burner with fuel canisters, a sketchbook and paints for me, and as little clothing as we could manage. We'd also packed on recommendation from the tourist literature, several cartons of cigarettes, chewing gum, and some cheap ballpoint pens, tokens to thank anyone we might feel would appreciate them. I took one worn copy of Time Magazine as well, which proved to be a coveted item wherever it was spotted by a native. On the cover were George McGovern and Thomas Eagleton, both easily recognized by Russians 
as the U.S. Democratic nominees for the party's leadership in that fall's election. I finally gave it to one persuasive guide, an intense young man who indicated that it was something he simply must own. I offered him gum instead, but he brushed that off, clearly determined to get that magazine out of my hands. Rob's comment. One copy of Time magazine is not going to turn the city of Harkow into a hotbed of revolution. Directions to the campsites from the cities were nearly non-existent. From the outskirts of Moscow, we stopped and asked directions from a group of young uniformed soldiers at the roadside. There was much hand gesturing and bad Russian as Rob pointed to our wretched map and repeated camping over and over. I tried forming the shape of a tent with my hands and indicated sleeping. Finally, after discussion among themselves, the three young men insisted on getting into the car and they would direct us. This turned out to be a complex, several mile winding route through highways and suburbs as they gestured. We were finally pointed entry to the campground. These generous young men would not take an offer of bus fare for their return, but I was able to dispense a pack of cigarettes to each of them. We assumed all Russians were smokers. They accepted politely. The first campsite was a modest sized campground with grassy meadows surrounded by nondescript trees with a few dozen spaces for tents, a wooden barracks type building for showers and toilets, the latter being more primitive than you can even imagine, and common faucets for water scattered here and there. A Viking Tours busload of young Brits were to arrive just ahead of us for the next several campsites, always commandeering the showers and chattering loudly, singing and drinking until late at night. So much for the Russian experience. After that first campsite, our assigned spots turned out to be small cabins with squeaky beds. We never needed the tent again. In each of those little cabins were two cot beds, a nightstand with a cracked pitcher, and a speaker mounted high on the wall from which we never heard music or any announcements. We figured that the speakers were actually receivers and they were ubiquitous at every cabin thereafter. A large Russian ear must be listening to us. One common feature of the campgrounds was the extended families of domestic cats that seemed to move comfortably among the people, accepting handouts and affection offered. There are many photos in our albums of which I am holding, feeding, or petting a tame resident cat. The catness greatly added to my camping pleasure as I missed our pet cats at home immensely. So there will be a part two follow up to this. So thank you very much. Thank you, Lucy. Every single time I hear your stories, I always feel like I need to just go out and, and indulge in a lot more adventure in my own life. So thank you so much. Uh, so uh, next up, I'd like to introduce Nancy. So Nancy Deverne Smith is a watercolor artist and writer. She has worked for newspapers and magazines, retiring from MIT in 2018. On the art side, she is co-president of the Newton Art Association and shows her paintings, paintings regionally. Mm -hmm. And Nancy is the newest member of our, um, of our group. So I'm delighted to have you hear what she is working on. Take it away, Nancy, it's yours. Thank you. Um, my project is a little bit more contemporary, uh, but still sort of falls within this milieu of, um, of memoir. Um, I'm working on a longer project that, that describes the first 12 months of my retirement. And it begins in the, final month that I was working at MIT. So it's like the jumping off point. So this story is part of that uh, chapter um, and it describes uh, a time uh, that I'd been through uh, commencement, but this was my last commencement. So my last MIT commencement. Over my 20 year MIT career, I've often attended commencement, a joyous congregation of families, friends and students awaiting degrees. Every June, this crowd of dressed up people remains remarkably cheery, despite waiting hours in the sun or the rain for their dear one to march. On June 8, 2018, I wanted to mingle one last time. Before 9 a.m., I walked down Memorial Drive along the sparkling Charles River and then through the white tented security station, flashing my press pass for campus police. Once inside the courtyard, I scanned for picturesque groups for social media photos. Snap, an Indian family in colorful fabrics, Snap, a bubbling brace of 20-something cousins waiting for their graduate to pass by. Snap, 
an Asian toddler in a miniature cap and gown waiting with daddy for her mother to march. And I settled into a folding chair, one of about 10,000, to think a bit. Commencement means beginning, but at universities, it usually signals the end of classes and campus life. This sort of junction evokes both nostalgia and anticipation. For students, MIT's intensity, often called drinking from the fire hose, is now routine, so it's time to start fresh. Students may glass backwards at triumphs and losses, and then forward, perhaps to launch something amazing. For faculty and staff, commencement is more like a lap in a long race. Faculty pace their teaching material through the semester, and at the end, bid favorite students farewell and await the next batch. For alumni association staff like me, the cycle of life includes deadlines, meetings, and reunions. Every, each year, my work as editorial director ranged from finding interesting graduates to feature in the alumni magazine to managing our daily blog, Slice of MIT. My team and I write about research like quantum computing or start alumni startups like producing a flying car. At MIT, there is always news. This year is my commencement too. Although I have three more weeks until my retirement date, I'm notching down the timeline. Never again will I have the option to call up alumni and freely ask questions about their life experiences. On the other hand, I won't be wrestling with daily deadlines and marketing goals. I'll miss the daily writing and publishing as I move from a small role at a famous university to being the star of my own life. I can use I more boldly in my next act as in what do I want to do now? For now, I still have roles. I'm helping interview an alumna on camera for a future video. At noon, my daughter May, 25, and I will join the Tech Day lunch crowd, and then we'll walk over to the sports fields to judge haiku and limerick contests. By 5 p.m., we'll be home and my life will change. My husband, Mark, and I will attend the uh, Newton Art Association annual soiree with 50 or so fellow artists enjoying a catered dinner and an exhibition of our newest members' artwork. I want some work to hold on to, a, to allay my horror vacui, and here it is. During the evening, I'll stand beside the current president and formally become the co-president. Snap, we are captured for the newsletter. Back at commencement, here comes the 50th reunion group, the class of 1968. They are veterans of the MIT experience. Many are successful beyond their youthful dreams. Now in their early 70s, they return to honor their MIT connection and their survival. A sea of white-haired men and a handful of women are positioned under the speckled shade of massive oak trees, standing out like cardinals in the snow in their long-awaited red jackets. The jackets and the right to lead the academic procession into the courtyard are honors bestowed 50 years after graduation. They settle in, nod to one another, smiling, and share old stories. Through interviews over the years, one characteristic has stood out. Alumni are grateful for their MIT experience. Before they arrived, many didn't know others with similar interests, or they were nerds isolated by being the smartest person around. At MIT, they found their peers. MIT was never easy, but the rewards have been lifelong. At this moment, memories of the night spent resting with problem sets have faded. Alumni sometimes say it takes 10 years to go from nausea to nostalgia. At this stage, they're also thankful for the people they love. That seems about right to me too. In an interview, a 90-something inventor told me the story of meeting the love of his life in his 30s, but losing her to another man. In his early 80s, he began courting her when she became a widow. Now married a decade, he told me, I'm the luckiest man in the world. Now that's a love story. Like this sea of graduates, I'm on the verge of a new life. My MIT experience has been rich, but I've had other lives. Before universities, I worked for newspapers and magazines. I've traveled to 36 countries, crossed the Sahara Desert in old European cars, and adopted a baby from China. When I was young, I didn't let fear stop me because I was more desperate for adventure than comfort. Now I'm experienced that, experiencing that Janus moment. Part of me looks back, and part forward. Leaving the familiar is a bit sad, but I'm excited to own my life in a new way. And I tend to be optimistic. Or maybe I'm just in denial. What's next? Evolution or earthquake, I'll soon see. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you so much. I um, can't wait to, for you to finish all of your stories about uh, what it is like to uh, be retired so that I can actually get it and, and take notes from um, what's to come and, and how to think about it and how to process it. So Excellent. Keep, yeah, keep on working, keep on working. 
All right, um, the next writer um, who we have is also one of our newest members and uh, it's David Kettner. So David is a graduate of MIT, having, uh, having spent six years there and a retiree of MIT Lincoln Laboratory where he worked for almost 38 years. He retired in 2005 and lives in Massachusetts. And uh, David, uh, uh, also like these other um, writers, has an amazing ability to transport us to uh, wherever he wants us to be. So I hope you enjoy his, his reading as well. Take it away, David. Thank you, Daphne. And good morning to everyone who's attending. Uh, this story is a, really a series of uh, snapshots about the place I grew up in in the 40s and 50s in Utah. Remembering Tooele, how do you get to MIT from somewhere in the Rocky Mountains? I was born in Tooele, Utah, a town in the desert. It is about 30 miles southwest of Salt Lake City and lies in a broad valley between two mountain ranges that lie north-south. The Salt Lake City Valley is to the east over the Ochre Mountain Range and the Great Salt Lake is to the north about 20 miles distant. In the middle of the 20th century, about 1950, there were about 10,000 people in the town, so it was a small town with a small town vibe to it. No one knows the origin of the name. The town lies up against some foothills in the Ochre Mountains at an elevation of, of about 5,200 feet. On the south edge of town near where I live, there is a hill we call Little Mountain. For young kids, it was an easy hike up the side. The hill was rocky and covered in low weeds and sage. From the top, we could look north toward the Great Salt Lake and see what we called the bench, like a beach area along the lower part of the Ochre Mountains, which was formed by the ancient Lake Bonneville, a part of the Pacific Ocean. As the land rose, the Pacific was cut off and the lake gradually contracted, due in part to evaporation. The salt concentration in the Great Salt Lake is much higher than that of the ocean. If we looked a bit toward the west of the lake, we could see the eastern edge of the Bonneville Salt Flats, where there were many attempts at land speed records by people in cars and on motorcycles. <clears throat> on our hikes to Little Mountain, we would find sun-bleached snail shells lying about on the ground, and we told ourselves that they came from the ocean. There were two main industries in the town, the Tuella Ordnance Depot, an army base, and the International Smelting and Refining Company, a subsidiary of the Anaconda Copper Company. My dad worked at the latter. Most men worked at one or the other. In families with children, the mothers were usually at home. There were a few small ranches with cattle near the town and much of the sagebrush around us was fenced in large sections for grazing cattle and sheep. There was some farming like wheat, but not much because it was so dry. When the Mormons settled in the area about 1850, they laid the town out in a north-south, east-west grid pattern. They made sure the main street, which ran north-south, was wide enough that a Conestoga wagon with a team of four horses could make a U-turn easily. The street was four lanes wide with space for angle parking on both sides. Consequently, the snow was in the winter, the snow was piled up in the middle of the street rather than at the side. Though we weren't supposed to do it, going to and from school, we would walk along the top of the snow pile, which was sometimes taller than we were. The principal cross street, Vine Street, had a railroad track down the middle of it. A local train made three or four trips daily through town, taking ore to the smelter, which was east of town. It was always exciting to see the steam engines chuffing through town, to hear the whistle and the bell, and smelled the coal-fired smoke. Since the train ran near the school, we would sometimes place a nail or bottle cap on the track for the train to crush. Today, the trains are gone, but one of the locomotives has found a home at a small museum in Booth Day, Maine, and another is at the Edieville Railroad in South Carver, Massachusetts. 
when I was young, about eight years old, my dad would take me on trips to the smelter on weekends. He was part of the management team, having started as a chemist in 1925. By the late 1940s, he had been promoted to superintendent of the concentrator, that portion of the smelter operations that took raw ore delivered in railroad cars and increased the percentage of the wanted metals, usually copper, lead, or zinc, in a sequence of grinding and flotation to separate out the unwanted material. The flotation process involved adding the powdery ore into a watery mix of, with special chemicals that carried the wanted metal off in a bubbly froth in huge mixers. The froth went into a dryer which removed the water and made the concentrate ready to go to the furnaces for further refining. The process ran 24 seven all year. My dad was visits the smelter on weekends to check on operations and make sure there were no problems. We would start at the chemical lab where he would talk with the people on duty and check on their analysis results on the stages of the concentrator processing. And then we walked uphill through the smelter plant over railroad tracks, under trestles, watching out for trains moving about and the like. It was an exciting trip for me for I loved the sounds and smells. It was always an adventure, and sometimes we would stop at a different spot to watch the operation. At the concentrator building itself, at the end of a long flight of wooden stairs up the hillside and into his office, there were new smells. Cigar and cigarette smokes blended with the smells of the chemicals used in flotation and the smell of sharpened pencils. The aromas were somewhat sharp and pervasive. The noise in the concentrator was terrific. Rock crushers, ball mills, rod mills, and the noise of dozens of flotation cells, each with its own electric motor to stir the mixture. I was fascinated by all the huge machinery and loved it all. Our house was not far from the center of town, the cross streets of Main and Vine. It was about two and a half blocks from our house, so it was an easy walk to the drugstore, the library, the Greek shoe repairman, the grocery store, the corner drugstore, and two movie theaters. The schools and an Olympic-sized indoor swimming pool were one or two blocks further down Vine Street. About age 10, I mastered the bicycle and the world opened up. The tracts of land around the town were fenced with barbed wire. There were dirt roads everywhere. My friends and I found our way into the nearby canyons and onto the ordnance depot through a broken down fence where we could crawl around in tanks and other equipment that was being dismantled. I was gone from the house for hours at a time. My mother never seemed to worry about where I was and seldom asked. It was a safe place for kids to explore and roam. There were a few cars on the paved roads and none on the dirt ones. One block south on our street, the road ran uphill toward the town cemetery. The little mountain was behind that. In the winter, the street was poorly plowed and lots of snow was left behind. So kids from all over town would come with their sleds to slide down. The town put up barriers at the end of the street to keep out traffic. We could spend hours on the hill in the winter. Having sufficient water was always a priority for the town. Our water came from the, from the nearby canyons and entered a water tank for the town. An irrigation ditch ran behind our lot in an alley. It carried water from the upper canyons as well. Once a week, the town turned water down it and households could divert the entire stream into their yard for an hour. Lots of people had vegetable gardens because that was part of their food supply. We used the water on the strawberry plants in the backyard and for mom's flowers in the front yard. <clears throat> One of my chores was to block the user upstream from us so the water could enter at our yard. Tooele was a good place to grow up. It was small, we felt safe there, and we couldn't get lost by being far from home. The townspeople had lots of tolerance for goofy kids at play. Opportunities for getting into trouble seemed to be few, although there were a few juvenile delinquents. Economically, it was a fairly level field. No one was particularly rich or poor, although it was clear that some families had more money than others. 
The Mormons were in the majority and occupied nearly every state and local government position and ran the state. Their teaching made sure that kids respected their elders and that carried over into the community. There was a certain pride in the community. People looked out for one another. Even though we were not Mormon, it didn't seem to be very important. In, in hindsight, the fact that my mother became the state president of PEO International would have been surprising, but she had good leadership and people skills and so was accepted. My dad being elected to the city council is another example of acceptance. As for my friends, being Mormon or not wasn't important at all. There were limitations, almost no blacks, despite the army base, and blacks could not join the Mormon church either at that time. No Jews, very few Catholics, limited opportunity and limited outlooks. The community was very white and very homogeneous. The world beyond town almost never broke into our lives. Sputnik is the most notable exception I can remember because I was interested in science. As school children, we never practiced the duck and cover maneuver like other kids. We may have been too sheltered and the world around us was small and narrow. Consequently, I doubt many of us developed much in the way of street smarts. We were all fairly naive in the ways of the world hicks as it were, but it sufficed, it sufficed for the 1950s and the location in, in which we lived. Now, how do I get to MIT from here? Thank you. Thank you, David. Isn't it amazing what we remember from our childhoods and the things that stay with us? I think that that's one of the wonderful things about uh, memoir is, is to go back and, and, and really relive all of that. And you get to tell kids about the time that you could answer your phone without knowing who was up over at the other end and all these wonderful ways that we used to live. So uh, next up, I would like to introduce our next leader, uh, Larry. Um, so, um, a little bit about Larry. So, Larry is a self-described MIT lifer. Having profited from the combined plan that MIT had with selected liberal arts colleges, he graduated in 1957 with an SB and EE from MIT and an AB from Amherst. After Fulbright in Paris, he caught the space bug and returned to MIT for an SM in EE and SCD in instrumentation, supported generously by Doc Draper, who hired him as an assistant professor of Aero Astro in 1962. And he's been here ever since. With Professor Y.T. Lee, he founded the Man Vehicle Lab, now the Human Systems Lab, and went on to work in space medicine, applying cybernetics to astronauts' spatial orientation and space motion sickness. That led to his experience as an alternate payload specialist on the space shuttle. He later became the founding director of NASA's National Space Biology Research Institute and head of the space education for its successor, the Translational Research Institute for Space Health. Meanwhile, back at MIT, as one of the founding faculty of the Harvard MIT Health Science and Technology, the HST program, he established and directed its graduate programs in bioastronautics. He remains active as the Apollo Pro Program Professor of Astronautics Emeritus. He was elected to the National Academy of Engineering, the National Academy of Medicine, and the International Academy of Astronautics. At MIT, he was a varsity ski racer and served as the ski team faculty advisor, like a real slacker, you know, <laughs> just didn't do anything at all. Um, so uh, I'd like to introduce you to Larry and uh, Larry, take it away. Thank you, Daphne. And th thank you to my colleagues on the, on the memoir group. Uh, I relied upon uh, Anthony and Daphne to select from a piece of my memoir, those parts that they thought might be more unusual and, and more interesting. Uh, there's a longer piece I call Training for Space Flight. And some of it has to do with the technical and some of it has to, has to do with the physical. But Anthony has selected parts that are a little different and I will read from them. 
you have them up on share screen, I believe. I do. <clears throat> Just to let everybody know, um, we're gonna. There is a fantastic piece, and it's uh, it's from the preview we sent out to each one of you. Um, we're gonna read for ten minutes, um, and we don't know how far that's gonna take us. So I'll be here to to step in once we reach the the ten minute mark. But really, a fascinating story. So Larry, you can take it away. Okay. So in our tradition. Three, two, one, liftoffs. Centrifuges and water survival. Much of our shuttle training was away from Houston. Water survival training was conducted by the Navy in Pensacola, Florida, to improve chances for survival in the event of a bailout from the shuttle or the T-38 following us, ferrying us from Houston to the Cape. We all went through the standard Navy training week. <clears throat> We learned to drown-proof ourselves by making our pant legs serve as balloons and to maneuver our way safely out of an inverted upside-down helicopter underwater. We dropped into Pensacola Bay by parasail in midwinter and then climbed into an inflated one-man life raft. raft. For the group rescue exercise, I volunteered to be the navigation officer. I was sure I could handle the job since we would never be more than 100 yards off, off the beach. Back at the Johnson Space Center, I was checked out for scuba diving and would sign on as an observer. I watched Story Musgrave and my close friend Jeff Hoffman as they practiced the intricately choreographed steps with, with which they were to, use, to employ in their EVA in space to put the Hubble Space Telescope in working order. To accustom ourselves to the G-forces of the shuttle launch and to verify the fit of our launch and entry suit, we rode the centrifuge at Brooks Air Force Base in San Antonio. Bill MacArthur was pleased to be our Army helicopter pilot for the trip. The, the the, uh, for the trip, the centrifuge exposure mimicked the shuttle launch with a maximum of, of three Gs during the eight-minute ride. That was easy. Of course, I experimented on myself by making some head movements during the rotation and produce the expected disorientation illusions and some slight nausea. On days like that, my training trip felt like a trip to Disneyland without the crowds. <clears throat> Unlike Johnson Space Center, where astronauts were commonly seen, we were figures of interest at the Cape. It took me only a short time to learn that the Cape meant Canaveral and not Cod. When we were wearing our blue flight suits, we got used to people looking at us, both NASA and outsiders. Our trips to Kennedy Space Center allowed us to see and touch our own shuttle. With the Columbia on the launch pad, we took the elevator way up the gantry and entered the shuttle from the white room, inspecting the real thing on the flight deck. And down below in the mid deck was a thrill. I biked around Merritt Island swam the ocean and drew all of the beach house. Some days I rented a windsurfer on nearby Indian River. On one trip shortly before launch, I was the only crew member free to ride on the transporter for the first part of its all night slow trip from the vertical assembly building to our launch pad. The trip was made at night to minimize the likelihood of damaging winds. Even though I had nothing to do except represent the, the crew, that ride was a thrill. So let me talk about flying, but not on the shuttle. In addition to training on the Space Lab life sciences experiments and shuttle operations, NASA scheduled several familiarization activities. John, my commander, took me flying in the NASA T-38 jet trainer for what they called a dollar ride, afforded all new crew. I was seated in the back seat behind John and marveled at Southern Texas's sites as John flew us from Ellington Field near Johnson out to our assigned maneuvering space over the Gulf of Mexico. And then I was given control of the plane. John, of course, could take over at any moment. We broke the sound barrier and made several gentle maneuvers. John would instruct me to establish the desired heading and attitude. I wasn't very adept at the task and wandered back and forth around the assigned compass heading. Then John suggested that instead of looking out the window, looking at the instruments rather, I might try looking out the window. 
Suddenly, on that blue sky day with a clear horizon in view, everything became much easier. On another day, just for fun, Dave Wolf, another crew member, took me up in his little plane to show me the aerobatic maneuvers which he performed during competitions. That was illuminating, but once was enough. The astronauts were also able to use new, the new Gulf Stream, which was acquired supposedly to allow mission specialists to maintain their piloting abilities. It was used whenever a good excuse could be found. We flew in it from Johnson to Kennedy. We flew to North Carolina for the funeral of Bill's mother. Nothing wrong with that. I was interested in the steep approach of the shuttle for its landing in Florida, so I was allowed to sit in NASA's modified Gulfstream cockpit while Rick practiced the 28-degree approaches to the landing strip at Kennedy. It looked and felt like falling out of the sky each time. Even before I began any astronaut training, I flew on numerous parabolic flights. After each 2G pullout, they followed a zero G path for 20 seconds, allowing us to practice some of our experiments in weightlessness and to have a lot of fun as well. The parabolic flights played an important part in the development of um, our equipment and procedures for our space lab experiments. Chuck Oman, Bob Renshaw and I from MIT, Doug Watt from McGill, Ken Money from Toronto all accumulated a lot of time in weightlessness, but 20 seconds at a time. <clears throat> I always enjoyed the chance to observe my own spatial orientation when moving around in zero-g parabola. I would avoid motion sickness on the vomit comet by limiting my head movements during the 2G pullout phases, separating each of the 40 or so freefall periods. I also took the max, the, the medication Scopedex scopolamine dexamphetamine before takeoff. For one of the flights during our crew training, I decided to, ev to evaluate my reactions to the in-flight medication being prescribed for astronauts. The intramuscular injection of promethazine was supposed to eliminate motion sickness symptoms, although it might bring on side effects that I intended to produce. I intended to produce the symptoms by making head movements on, in on flight, uh, I told the onboard flight surgeon that I intended to produce the symptoms during the early parabolas, and then to have me inject, have him inject the usual dose of 50 milligrams of promethazine in my arm. And so we did. I made the head movements, got nauseated, almost to the point of vomiting, and he gave me an injection. So far, so good except that the symptoms didn't really disappear. An hour later, after landing back at Ellington, I could barely find my car, and driving the five miles back to home was like trying to drive after a week without sleep. Fortunately, I made it, crawled into bed, dead to the world for the rest of the day, and convinced me that I would avoid that drug, at least in that dosage, if I ever got space sickness. How we do it on time, Anthony? We're doing pretty well. We're at eight minutes, so we'll go yeah, another section. Absolutely. Another couple of minutes. Payload. Yes. The payload training, as opposed to the shuttle training, was intense, <clears throat> fascinating, and right up my alley. We spent time with each of the principal investigators in their home laboratories or in Houston and received hands-on instruction from world-class scientists. We understood the scientific approaches as well as the operation of the facilities and how to fix them following a set of malfunc mouse, malfunction procedures. After the introductory tutorials, we were individually coached, coached by the very capable and always supportive General Electric payload training team. We practiced on the wide range of the human and rat studies to answer questions like bone loss, muscle deconditioning, cardiovascular or respiratory regulation and weightlessness. I was especially pleased to observe the crew's acceptance of our onboard computer assistant, we called PI, Principal Investigator, in a box, which I had invented to assist the astronauts on board. I remained the PI in the extensive set of human vestibular experiments, including the rotating dome to assess the way weightlessness altered the vestibular effects and spatial orientation. But I left all of the training for the baseline pre and post-flight testing 
to my deputy PI and former student, Dan Murfeld, who performed faultlessly. Dan was a recent PhD of mine who went on to be a professor at Harvard and then, then at Ohio State, specializing in the vestibular system. Some of the training was hard, and I don't mean physically demanding. For me, the most difficult procedure involved inserting a catheter into the tiny blood vessel of the tail of a rat. It was used to draw blood and insert a radioactive tracer for calcium turnover studies. Since this was done with our hands in surgical gloves, with arms inserted into isolated, reduced pressure glove boxes, it took all my marbles to avoid puncturing the wall of the vessel. It was much easier to insert a catheter into a vein of one of the patient volunteer trainees. First of all, the rats and I didn't get along. They seemed to sense that I was nervous around them and I had trouble grabbing one. First to inject a small catheter into the tail vein and then to sacrifice it in the guillotine. No wonder they were nervous. One time I was bitten and was sent to see Dr. Richard Jennings, our flight surgeon. He had not dealt with rat bites before and together we looked up the treatment. It was nothing special, but from then on I wore reinforced leather gloves. Once the animal was sacrificed, we only had a few minutes to complete the dissection before the samples would begin to deteriorate. Starting with the identification and removal of the vestibular organs in the inner ear, we proceeded to dissect all of the organs for study by the PI teams. My inability to do that rapidly and precisely may have been my major shortcoming in the final payload specialist selection process. I couldn't disagree with the PI's and the mission director's decision to select my roommate, Marty, for the actual job in space. Uh, that's probably about, about, oh, about so enough. Was a veterinarian. Yeah, Marty was a veter veter veterinarian, by the way. Well, let me take this moment, if you can look, look over the shoulder. I introduce my, Hi. my wife, Hi. my wife, Vicki Goldberg, who, Hi, is, who is a professional writer and tolerates with more than amusement and, uh, and encouragement our memoir writing activities. Oh, That's Larry. wonderful. Nice to meet you. Nice Welcome. to meet you. Larry speaks so highly of you. I knew he was a good writer before you did because he was doing this for his children at first. And he said, when people tell him he's a good writer, he says, I write the way I talk. So I'm very lucky because I get to talk to him all the time. That's <laughs> lovely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, so, so um, as you see, all of these writers just have an incredible incredible collective amount of stories. And every single time we get together, more come out. Um, so in the process of workshopping some of what they were bringing to the, the group, they might recall at that moment something else, but it's a, it's a generous group. They give each other a lot of feedback, a lot of helpful feedback and, and different ways to think about it. Or they're actually moved to talk about um, something that they remembered because of those stories that, that they've just shared. But uh, my experience with the group has been that um, they bring just incredible experiences and that they learn from each other and they have suggestions for each other. And all the suggestions are usually uh, spot on and kind and uh, direct and everybody comes out with a, I think a, a better piece or feeling a lot more inspired and certainly very willing to produce more work uh, when they come back um, the next month. So this is, this is the, the showcase part of, of the reading where everybody has um, shared um, what is gonna be in this publication. I think you remember from Lucy and from Larry that they have part twos coming from, um, from the stories that they shared here. So that means that we'll be able to, to um, you know, to satisfy our curiosity or whatever suspense we were left in uh, from those stories. And uh, so I wonder if uh, you all had any questions. I think um, hopefully you'll see the chat function um, at the bottom of your screens or somewhere around your screens and you can certainly put them there. But I have a couple of questions here that maybe the writers would like to to take and, and see what, um, what you think about uh, responding to these. So one of them is, um, 
I was a retirement counselor for over 20 years and then I retired. What does the other side of the coin look like? So what do you all have to say uh, about retirement? Yeah, Nancy and David. Mm -hmm. So I think it's fantastic actually. Um, but I think it also depends on what structures and connections you need to make it a new life, but a great life. And one of the things I've been writing about is like what I need. And I seem to want structure and to be involved in organizations and things like that. That sort of keeps me balanced. Other people have said, oh, well, I'll decide when I retire. And, you know, maybe that works well or not. But I think, you know, being uh, thinking about how much structure in your time how many people do you want to see on a, on a regular basis? Um, how often you want to get out of the house, which is now, of course, a more complicated thing. All those things help you set yourself up for a good experience. Thank you. And David? Uh, I, I would only add to that by saying, uh, repeating something a, a good friend of mine told me, and that was that retirement is entirely underrated. It's much better than you think. <laughs> yeah, uh, Tom. I think you're muted, Tom. So, uh, yeah, one thing I also you know want to say is you know just like this uh, memoir class does for us is it opens up our now time to continue to learn and grow. You know, so we spent all our years doing something in uh, you know at work. You know, me at the lab for uh, thirty years, and now all of a sudden you know I have free time to explore new things, and I think that's what you have to do is you know use that time you know, to uh, relearn and, and try things you've never tried. So uh, for me, it's been a whole new life, a whole new experience. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. So, um, yeah, Jackie, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Larry. Repeat what I wrote. Uh, sure. When she, when she was in HR, Helen, uh, Ellen Cushman was our captain, our life, uh, she, in charge of the lifeboat. Uh, she and uh, her her answers were always well thought out and encouraging, and I have to say, years later, Ellen, most of them were right. Thank you. Here you go. So yes, I, I think that um, in hearing some of the stories that that we kind of trade around and uh, during our sessions, there is um, this feeling of getting to do new things and uh, but appreciating having something to come do as a group that's expanding your yourself a little bit more. All right, and now there there's also a question um, about how you all as uh, writers treat um, identifying folks in your work. Do you use your, the real names? Do you change them? And how do you make those decisions? I can, I can tell you a little bit about that as you all think about it. The, the, I think it just depends, right? It depends on who, whose eyeballs are gonna be on the work and um, whether there is any real need to refer to people through their real names. So you can change them depending on what you want to uh, accomplish with that. Uh, but usually it's, it's fine to name uh, people if there's no harm um, that is gonna come from their names being there. If you ever feel a little bit iffy, it's always um, a good idea to change their names. Yes, Larry. Yeah, um I find myself struggling not with do I change the name because mine is a factually based uh, memoir, but who do I leave out? For example, in what I just read to you, I referred to the experiments on which I was an investigator and then went out of my way to mention the five leading colleagues I had. Well, there are probably five more who were in the second tier. Am I insulting them by not mentioning them? Is it boring to the rest of the world to just have this endless acknowledgement? What do you think, Jeffrey? Well, I think again, it just depends. It's, it's like you know, it's like when you go and accept a, an award, and you you name people, and then you step down, and you forget to to mention the the one person that matters the most, right? But I think it's a balance act uh, of how much real estate you want to offer to naming people individually, and does it have a function of of in a narrative, which is you know, 
memoir still is telling a story. And in order for you to tell the story, it still needs to have the, the elements of a good story, right? So if it's necessary to name 10 people versus five people um, for the purpose of telling that story well, then that's what you do. Well, but I, if it does, yeah. Mm -hmm. No, definitely I find it's, a, it's the risk of insulting someone. By for leaving them out? Hmm. Yeah, I, I look, I think um, sometimes you're going to, um, there's no way to avoid that because that's exactly what it what it's like in real life. You know, you <laughs> unless you maybe see that person in front of you and you are reminded that you have to go uh, write about them, it just may be a function of the fact that A, they really weren't that important for you to tell the story and you can't protect everybody um, it, when, you, when you work. You just have to write um, how something comes to you. And so the first, I, I think your first uh, responsibility is to yourself and how you recall that story. And once it's gonna be out in the world, then you start thinking about, well, who may have an issue with this or who might I offend with this? Um, but more often than not, I think that it, it works out really well because how you remember something is how you actually tell a story. It's like what your wife just said, you write how you talk. And, um, and I think that you, all of you actually have a, a incredible propensity for, for a lot of detail in what you remember. So the first responsibility is to the story and to how you remember it. And then as it goes out into the world, then you start thinking about the implications of that. But don't censor yourself right away and don't think about who you may or may not offend um, you know, at any given moment um, by writing it. I'd like to hop in on that too. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. The project I'm working on, I, I talk about the first year of retirement and each month has sub themes as well. For example, August, which is the second full month of retirement. One of the things I write about is uh, a sense of belonging. And, you know, most of us have had some strong connection to our workplaces or, you know, some, you know, vivid connection. So when you are away from that, um, that sense of belonging is gone. So how do you rebuild that sense of belonging? How do you examine it? So I ask a lot of people I know, you know, questions about things like that. Uh, another chapter is on how appearances change when you hit this, uh, you know, stage in life. Uh, one is like a definition of what does work become? So I ask other people, but I you just use their first names. Mm -hmm. um, and if it's uh, a sensitive matter, I would probably give them the opportunity to give, have a pseudonym, even for their first name, before it goes any wider than basically a draft. Mm -hmm. Yes, David. Yeah, for the, for the work I've done, the, most of the people uh, that I've mentioned are deceased. Um, but they are people who have been um, important to me in, in one way or another in terms of pointing me in a certain direction or to helping advance my career in some way. So every time I've writ written their name down, it, it's for me, it's been more a case of trying to honor the, this, mm. this person that they and, and to tell people this person existed. And they did something for me that was helpful. So I haven't had to come to grips yet with the you know writing about people who are still alive. I'm not not quite sure how I would do that. But for the um, so that that's how I've I've kind of managed my way through the problem. Yeah, I I love that idea of actually using the. The, the space that you have in the story to, to honor somebody who's important to you and, um, and to make sure that others know about that person. And I think that that's a great uh, example of just how powerful uh, it can be to, to write uh, these people into, into our stories. And you know the, the thing about memoir, and one of the reasons why it used to get such a bad rap, it's because they were such confessionals sometimes, right? And people mm -hmm. would use it to um, to settle scores uh, yeah. to the point where you had somebody in a family write a memoir and then like the mother would write a, a competing memoir for that memoir. And uh, so it's, it's tricky, I think, 
uh, if you start writing about issues that are um, conflicts between um, individuals who um, have, in your experience, uh, grieved you in, in some way or grieved you in some way, or that you're still trying to sort something out with and who are still very much alive. And, yes. but when you go publish something, uh, it's, um, I think the publishing industry has gotten burned probably in the early 90s from a very famous uh, book, uh, James Frey, um, and, um, you know, where he just, not just mm -hmm. embellished, but, but he super embellished. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I think that now when you go to publish something that's going to be in the public eye, somebody will from that publishing house will make you sign documents and then we'll reach out to people. I've mm -hmm. had friends who publish memoirs who just can't uh, get okays from uh, relatives to approve something and they have to work around that somehow. So take chunks out of books um, mm -hmm. or um, rewrite something uh, from a different perspective uh, or take a chance that they might get sued. So. Mm -hmm. It, it just, it's a spectrum. And I think that when you worry about um, being, exposing someone or offending someone, you, I think it's, it's a matter of who's going to be reading this. But for the sake of you telling your story, you should tell it how you remember. Any other questions? And then um, I do have a, a really lovely comment here. Um, it's uh, what an extraordinary group of memories, uh, memorists. I think that Nita would have rejoiced with a variety of experience that is represented by these books. And that is, um, I have to tell you, um, I, it, it is um, a wonderful group of, of writers and, uh, but Nita's hands and, and her uh, influence is, is all over these stories uh, still, so. All right, comments, and would anybody like to comment on anything or have uh, any questions for the memorists, for Anthony or Tracy, for me, I'm happy to answer. Okay. Uh, we will uh, we'll be on after we end the recording for just a short while. If you'd like to say anything to the mm -hmm. memoirist, you mm -hmm. don't have to be recorded. Mm -hmm. um, I'll do I'll do a little finisher for the video. Thank you, everybody, for coming out. This was so fun. It was so great to be able to share the stories of these uh, memoirists with all of you, and and this has been wonderful. Actually, right. Anne, you're all, you're going to offer our closing remarks. That's and, right. And right. On the video, uh, so. I I want to thank everyone. Um, these were amazing and just fascinating stories. I I can't tell you how much I enjoyed it, and I clapped in silence, but now I will clap for all of you. Um, it was especially moving, I think, to hear it in your own voices. It, it really captures your attention. Um, I don't know if any of you would consider doing that in the future, but it, it makes it an extra interesting. Um, I want to thank Daphne, I, all the writers, and I, Daphne and the audience for joining us, and especially Tracy and Anthony for putting this on. Without them, we would not have been able to have this event. And I really want to thank them for doing that. And the last thing I want to say is a happy Thanksgiving to everyone. Um, I know it's going to be a very unusual Thanksgiving for all of us, but hopefully we'll get through it and get on to 2021. Um, and if you have any questions, questions, feel free to contact us and we'll do our best to answer, um, answer it and look forward to having this up on our website. So if you want to listen to it again or share it with others, thanks very much. Stay well. Thank you.